eu uh, tenho a, a tarefa apenas de fazer essa apresentação inicial, distribuição das atividades, mas eu gostaria de fazer uma propaganda, é, que não é minha, o, um grupo uh, de professores liderado pelo uh, professor Roberto Roque Lauxen traduziu a biografia uh, do Paul Ricoeur, Os Sentidos de uma Vida, escrito por François Dosse. Dosse, você que é, diz que é extremamente recomendado e ela foi traduzida, acaba de ser lançada e eu, onde é que está o Lau, que você não está aqui. Então, digo isso porque realmente é importante para toda a sociedade requeriana que, e aqueles que não dominam o francês. Bom, uh, então nós temos o prazer de ter o professor George Taylor hoje à noite aqui para nos brindar com a sua conferência. E eu vou passar a palavra, então, à Marcela, que vai fazer uma apresentação, então, do, do Taylor, da sua atividade. E o, o Leonardo vai coordenar depois a parte das perguntas uh, relativamente ao que o público vai fazer. E para vocês entenderem, está aqui na tela o nosso amigo Fernando Nascimento, que foi um dos mentores intelectuais e que, do, do porquê que esse evento está acontecendo aqui e por que ele está se efetivando, na verdade. Não só porque aqui ele esteve na organização do início ao fim e vai estar até o final nos relatórios, né? É, e, e o Taylor depois quer fazer uma menção a ele uma conversa. Então, eu sigo na, na nossa atividade, passando a palavra, então, para a Marcela. Uh, thank you, professor. Uh... We would like to thank you for being here with us. It's a great honor. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you in Portuguese for people to understand. Então, hoje nós temos aqui o professor uh, George Taylor. E um, ele graduou-se na Universidade de Brown, continuou seus estudos de pós-graduação na Universidade de Chicago, também se formou em Direito em Harvard, Uh, atualmente é professor na Universidade de Pittsburgh e o Taylor escreveu extensivamente sobre a obra do Paul Ricoeur, né? atuou como editor uh, na grande obra do Ricoeur, Ideologia e Utopia, e passou muitos anos elucidando a noção de imaginação na obra de Ricoeur e atualmente está editando palestras sobre a imaginação uh, do Ricoeur para posterior publicação. Ele possui uma vasta contribuição na tradição da hermenêutica e da fenomenologia. Então, nós temos aqui é, um estimado filósofo né? e, e um grande pesquisador de Ricoeur. Então, eu apresento para vocês George Taylor. Can you hear? Ok, good. Uh, what we're going to do before my presentation of the paper, we thought it'd be an opportunity for you to see a digitization project that I'm working on with Fernando Nascimento. And Fernando will present in Portuguese to show you what is available. And I just wanted to say that uh, working with Fernando is an instance of people from the Recur Society and people from ASIR working together for the international development of Recur Studies, and has been one of my great pleasures uh, in terms of my scholarly work with, with Recur to work with Fernando on this project. Um, and uh, without going into further, I'll just turn it over to Fernando. Thank you, Fernando. Gustavo, o áudio não está saindo aqui.
A gente está tendo alguns problemas técnicos aqui, mas em breve acredito que já vai resolver. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Taylor. Uh, we um, we've been working the uh, digital recur project, uh, which is uh, attempted to digitize uh, the work of. Uh, on uh, recur, initially the primary works and then the secondary works. Yeah, and I'll, I'll turn it, uh, I'll turn to Portuguese, uh, Professor Taylor, just to uh, make it easier. Um, bom, o, o projeto digital recur, é, vocês conseguem me ouvir bem, imagino, né? Caso não consiga, só me ouvir. Me grita aí, por favor. Uh, eu vou começar a mostrar aqui na tela. O Walter, você abaixa um pouquinho, por favor, a tela, só do computador. Isso, beleza. Ótimo. Bom, eu vou tentar ser rápido para não atrapalhar a palestra do professor Taylor, mas uh, queria falar rapidamente sobre o contexto do projeto e o que já foi feito, né? Uh, tudo nós começamos esse se vocês quiserem saber mais informações uh, depois dessa apresentação tem um trabalho que foi publicado na Etude de Viena que descreve um pouco esse trabalho é publicado uh, no volume 7 número uh, e, e talvez eu vá direto para o ponto do projeto mesmo que uh, provavelmente vai ser mais claro o que a gente uh, tem feito é digitalizar toda a obra de Riquet em inglês, inicialmente. Uh, são 41 livros publicados e traduzidos para o inglês e mais de 250 artigos. Uh, e, e, em seguida, nós vamos para os textos em francês e a Maria Lohan e a Alejandra a Bertucci estão nos ajudando com os textos em espanhol. Uh, também o Patrício, que eu vejo ali no fundo, é, nos ajudou também a, na coleção dos textos uh, em espanhol. Então, nós estamos fazendo isso gradativamente uh, e começando pelos textos em inglês. Então, deixa eu mostrar um pouquinho para vocês uh, o Digital Recurve, é esse portal. E, uh, vocês já podem, ele está disponível aqui, então... Vocês só precisam digitar digitalcare.org.org é, e vai... Uh, então, assim, existe todo um problema que a gente não pode disponibilizar os textos completos, porque os textos ainda estão com copyright, uh, proteção de copyright. Então, o que nós fizemos, nós uh, podemos mostrar apenas parte do texto. É, então, vocês vão ver que vocês podem, por exemplo, procurar em todos os livros do Piquet, onde ele menciona a palavra hermenêutica. Vocês estão conseguindo ver bem aí? Sim? Ok. Eu vou aumentar um pouquinho para ver se melhor. Melhorou? Ok. Ah, então, quando eu coloco aqui a palavra hermeneutics, né, ele mostra uh, que há 3.614 menções à hermenêutica no, uh, no corpus do Fier. E se você descer um pouquinho aqui na tela, você vai ver todos os textos que mencionam a palavra hermenêutica. Então, por exemplo, no conflito das interpretações, a palavra hermenêutica é mencionada 411 vezes. E se você clica aqui no conflito da é, interpretação, ele vai te mostrar todas as vezes em que a palavra é mencionada e a página em que a palavra foi mencionada. Então, uh, você consegue ter uma referência bibliográfica 
uh, instantânea de todo o corpus do Riquet inicialmente em inglês. E, em seguida, a gente vai passar isso para as outras línguas também, como eu disse. A próxima é, é o francês. Uh, começamos em inglês simplesmente pelo fato de que era mais uh, fácil ter acesso aos documentos digitalizados e também porque a gente estava esperando a permissão do Paul Ricoeur para continuar o trabalho em francês. E essa permissão foi dada é, no verão passado. Uh, e por, nós, nós vamos continuar com o trabalho para o francês também. Então, aqui você consegue fazer a busca por todos os, qualquer termo, qualquer uh, palavra no corpus uh, requeriano. Tá? Uh, uh, além disso, você também pode fazer análises um pouco mais sofisticadas. Por exemplo, se você uh, quisesse saber qual é a palavra uh, que foi mais o conjunto de termos mais utilizados uh, pelo que é nos seus livros. Uh, então, esse, esse primeiro gráfico aqui, ele te mostra exatamente isso. Uh, então, uh, aqui está computado, estão computadas todas as palavras que foram escritas por, por Riquet e publicadas nos livros em inglês. E o tamanho das palavras é uma expressão de quão frequente elas apareceram nos textos. E se você passa com o mouse aqui por cima você vê o número total de dimensões. Por exemplo, Riquet escreveu a palavra história 8.614 vezes nos seus livros. Ah, e aí, com essa ferramenta, você também pode... É, aqui você está vendo todos os textos, todos os livros. Ah, se você quiser mudar a escala para um determinado ah, texto, por exemplo, ah, se você quiser ver ah, as palavras utilizadas em O Homem Falível, ah, 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 é só você fazer a, a delimitação para esse texto e aqui aparece ah, o conjunto de palavras. Então, vocês esperariam encontrar ah, sentimento, ah, mal, humano, são palavras ah, extremamente importantes e que algumas podem ser surpreendentes. E a ideia é que, ao serem surpreendentes, elas abrem a, a, a pesquisa para saber por que, que essa palavra está aparecendo aqui. Você pode aumentar a quantidade de palavras que estão sendo exibidas, por exemplo, para 100 palavras, e aí você ganha uma nova visão de cada um dos textos. Tá? Ah, e, e aqui você tem outras ferramentas. Eu queria mostrar para vocês... Ah, essa ferramenta das tendências. Então, por exemplo, a gente poderia pesquisar todas as vezes que Aristóteles é mencionado por Riquet, e isso nos dá um gráfico com as obras nas quais a Riquet está mencionando Aristóteles. Então, por exemplo, na metáfora viva, Uh, o número de dimensões é significativo. E este gráfico aqui, então, de certa forma, mostra como Riquet foi dialogando com Aristóteles ao longo de seus livros. E a gente pode, por exemplo, acrescentar Gadáfia aqui. Uh, e aí a gente vai ter um segundo gráfico, que a gente vai uh, os pontos em que tanto Aristóteles quanto Gadáfia são citados significativamente por Riquet. Uh, e, e não precisam ser apenas filósofos, podem ser conceitos também. Uh, por exemplo, o tema do nosso congresso, hermenêutica e ética, a gente poderia fazer... Ops, a gente poderia criar um gráfico aqui uh, sobre todas as menções uh, relacionadas à hermenêutica, como esperado, hermenêutica e as ciências sociais é um texto no qual a palavra hermenêutica é poderante. História e hermenêutica, é, do texto à ação. E depois a, a coletânea de artigos a hermenêutica, né, que também foi publicada em português. E a gente pode correlacionar esse texto com ética. 
e então a gente vai ter um, um gráfico atualizado no, no qual, nos quais os dois conceitos vão ser apresentados nos livros de que é. E a ideia é que essa vai ser uma ferramenta que aos poucos a gente vai ah, melhorando para dar insights, para dar novas ah, ah, ideias de pesquisa, tanto para os novos pesquisadores, quanto para aqueles que usam isso para suas pesquisas cotidianas. Imagino que todos vocês já passaram horas tentando encontrar uma determinada situação para escrever um artigo, né? Uh, e agora isso tudo fica disponível imediatamente. Uh, um, uma última uh, ferramenta que eu vou mostrar hoje, para encerrar aqui em 15 minutos, é essa ferramenta de correlações. Mas, por exemplo, se você quisesse saber uh, as palavras que normalmente estão associadas com a palavra hermenêutica em Riquet, ou seja, Todas as vezes em que Riquet menciona hermenêutica, ele também menciona tal palavra. Né? Então, uh, ops, vou aumentar aqui. Há 2.459 citações de uh, hermenêutics, né? Só um segundo, deixa eu atualizar aqui. E essa ferramenta, ela vai mostrar uh, a evolução da palavra junto com os contextos nos quais a palavra uh, é utilizada. Deixa eu atualizar aqui novamente. E aqui vocês estão vendo que, obviamente, uh, para... E é, isso talvez seja uma coisa interessante de pensar, né? Ah, 80% dos contextos em que Riquet fala sobre hermenêutica, ele também fala sobre tradição, ah, fala sobre entendimento, sobre texto e sobre sentido. Então, você poderia usar aqui qualquer palavra que te interessa na pesquisa para entender quais os contextos nos quais Riquet utiliza essa palavra. Né? Ah, então, como eu disse para vocês, ah, ah, o link é esse do Digital Recur. Quando vocês entrarem, vocês ah, vão ah, preencher um formulário dizendo da instituição onde trabalham e o, o motivo pelos, pelo ah, que, que o leva a ter interesse no trabalho. Por quê? Porque a gente teve que colocar uma série de seguranças em torno do portal, uma vez que os textos originais não podem ser apresentados. Então, uh, é necessário ter esse esse cuidado adicional. E aí vocês vão receber um link por e-mail, e ao clicar nesse link por e-mail, vocês têm acesso a esse portal. Tá okay? uh, nós estamos trabalhando agora para terminar os artigos em inglês. Em seguida, serão incluídos os textos em francês. E, se tudo correr bem, em breve teremos também os textos em espanhol e, quem sabe, os em português. Uh, so, uh, I would now uh, hand it over to, to Professor Taylor, uh, so he can uh, comment on any other aspect that he wants and, and uh, uh, resume the, the presentation. Tchau, Walter. Vou desligar aqui, ok? <laughs> thank you, Fernando. You may want to thank him. Um, it's, as Fernando mentioned at the end, we are inviting people to uh, request, uh, if they want to sign up for this, uh, to participate 
uh, I just shoot, I sent an email to Fernando in particular. If you need the information, you can ask me uh, afterward. And it's also, if you use this site and have questions or suggestions for improvement, please let us know. Um, and there's a way to do that on the site as well. This is still in the process of development. Uh, so, so thank you for your attendance uh, on this and for your patience in waiting for it to come up. Okay. Okay, okay so now I'm going to switch to uh, my paper uh, and um, again, appreciate your patience uh, and giving some time to show this presentation. Uh, so my title, Why Ideology in Utopia Today, and I should say, uh, Fernando did the translation uh, for this, and so I thank him also for providing the translation, and you should be able to follow as I uh, go through in English. Um, so uh, as some of you know, this past summer, the Von Recur in Paris held a week-long workshop on Recur's lectures on ideology in utopia to commemorate the publication of the volume and bring it to the attention of a newer generation of Recur scholars. As the editor of this volume, I was of course pleased to participate in the workshop and my reflections here are an outgrowth of thinking about what the book might continue to mean for us in our contemporary social and political environment. My title has at least two dimensions. First, why should we pay attention to the concepts of ideology and utopia today? Aren't they outmoded? with ideology a vestige of Marxist thinking of a prior generation of thought and utopia a romanticist and escapist notion. A second form of my question is why should we pay attention to the discussion of ideology and utopia in Recur's book on that subject. Here too is Recur's discussion outmoded. He spends five chapters of that text after all on Marx and another three on Althusser. Aren't the interrogation of those figures passe? Meanwhile, Recur's discussion of utopia focuses on 19th century figures such as Saint-Simon and Fourier. You will not be surprised that I continue to find value in the lectures on ideology and utopia. I do have some ambivalence about whether the concept of, of ideology retains currency, its connotation is generally pejorative. But whether or not we like the term, ideology remains, as I shall discuss, a significant placeholder for issues that remain quite vital. And I do want to emphasize the continuing importance of the concept of utopia. To establish the continuing vibrancy of the lectures, I will first undertake some steps to locate its themes within larger dynamics of contemporary discussion on the nature of human cognition outside of Recur's work, and then we'll turn to the lecturer's distinctive and decisive contributions to this understanding. I will also try to show why the lectures remain distinctive within Recur's corpus and a fruitful subject for further research. I will contextualize the current significance of the lectures in three steps. All three of them show the dislocation of reason as foundational and so engage in a critique of the sufficiency of the Enlightenment legacy. In the words of George Lakoff, to whom I shall return, we cannot understand 20th century, 21st century politics on the basis of the model of an 18th century brain. The Enlightenment emphasis on the mind operating on the basis of reason and facts is insufficient. The three steps of contextualization will work from broad to narrow, and I begin with a very general understanding of the brain articulated in recent decades in the field of what has become known as behavioral economics. Do not be put off by the reference to economics. The main studies here lie in cognitive psychology. This work challenges the thesis of mainstream econ economics that we each seek to maximize our economic utility. Let me offer an example through some variations. Why do newspaper articles typically be begin by focusing on the story of one individual affected by whatever the subject of the story is about, rather than about the larger class of those affected? Why do we categorize groups in a summary fashion? Muslim, woman, American, French. Why do most people in North America have in their sense, in their head a sense of the normal person as white, male, heterosexual, and able-bodied? In all these cases, the research shows that we are very bad 
at statistical reasoning, instead think on the basis of prototypes. A story comes to life when we understand its implication for one affected individual rather than a statistical multitude. We tend to categorize quickly on the basis of groups and assumed norms. It would be much more rational and economic to think empirically and statistically, but we do not. So what's the point? The research indicates that the brain operates on the basis of two systems. System one is more automatic and instinctive. It operates unconsciously, proceeds on the basis of associations, such as prototypes, requires no attention or effort, and functions quickly. System two, by contrast, is more reflective and consists of what we more typically consider a rational reasoning process. It engages in systematic evaluation, is controlled, takes conscious effort, and proceeds more slowly. For our purposes, it is essential to recognize that system one is the default system for the brain. System two engages only when necessary and often accepts system one judgments. Think of your average day. Much of our activity is undertaken automatically, dressing, eating, brushing our teeth, driving. We could not function if we had to deliberate about each of the thousands of decisions we make daily. System one also involves what we call in English gut, it's cutting off, uh, gut reactions. Our stomach speaks. We have an emotive reaction positively or negatively to an event, and our response is colored by this non deliberative emotional reaction. The system one function is typically effective and allows us to move forward, but it also acts on the basis of shortcuts, such as prototypes, and these can be inaccurate and dysfunctional. The implications of the interrelations of system one and two are both fascinating and tr tremendously significant. I commend to each one of you, no matter what your field, an excellent book on the subject by one of its main proponents, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. In my view, you need to know the basics of behavioral economics to understand better how the world works. But for our conversation, what is critical is the challenge of behavioral economics to the enlightenment prioritization of reason. Instead, the mind works much more fundamentally on the basis of the intuitive, effective factors of system one. System two rationality is often more subordinate to the operation of system one it takes a lot of work to engage system two to overcome any system one limitations. The second step in contextualizing the significance of recurs lectures moves us to the narrower framework of cognitive linguist George Lakoff. Lakoff is himself attentive to the dynamics of behavioral economics, but his major contribution lies in showing how the mind works primarily on the basis of metaphor. He is particularly famous for his work with Mark Johnson, Metaphors We Live By. And it may be of interest that Mark Johnson was a graduate student of Recur at the University of Chicago. In, Lecur in Lakoff's extensive writings, he argues forcefully for the foundation of human cognition, not in the literal, but in metaphor. The emphasis here is similar to that in behavioral economics and prototypes. Metaphors too are typically unconscious and automatic, and proceed on the basis of type rather than categories with clearly delineated boundaries. There are obvious resonances of recurs, excuse me, of Lakoff's work also with recurs on metaphor, a point of relevance to which I return. Lakoff's extension of his work on metaphor to politics. He criticizes the typical view that in politics, all that is needed is to provide facts and figures to show where people's interests lie and people will vote accordingly. This approach Lakoff maintain, maintains ignores the cognitive unconscious, does not reach our deepest values and suppresses legitimate emotions. Instead, he claims we need to embrace a deep rationality that can take account of and advantage of a mind that is largely unconscious, embodied, emotional, empathetic, metaphoric, and only partial universal. Lakoff insists that we cannot stick to policy and interest groups in issue by issue debate, but must attend politics, moral, mythic, and emotional dimension. 
But it's this moral, mythic, and emotional dimension of politics that, I shall argue, recurs discussion of ideology and utopia tends and deepens particularly well. The third step in contextualizing the lectures turns us to the social imaginary. Castoriadis, Recur, and Charles Taylor are generally recognized as the leading thinkers on the social imaginary, although Recur's work on the social and cultural imagination is more a subtext in the lectures than a well-developed theme. A new journal, Social Imaginaries, is proving to be an important locus for discussion on this topic. Attention to the social imaginary participates in the hermeneutic turn in the social sciences and elucidates how con cultural configurations of meaning orient our encounter with the world and influence the formation of social institutions and practices. The social imaginary also emphasizes the social and creative aspects of the imagination, the ability to reform social institutions. In opposition to materialistic and quantitative reductions of reality, the social imaginary highlights the ineradicable quality of structures of meaning or of meaninglessness in social life. In the words of Charles Taylor, the social imaginary has a constitutive function. It is not ornamental, not epiphenomenal. The larger significance of the lectures on ideology and utopia lies in their development of the symbolic mediation of action. I want to determine how this theme can at once be integrated into the contemporary contextual factors just discussed and at the same time illuminate the meaning of ideology and utopia. It is also essential to appreciate that the symbolic mediation of action persists as a theme in recur as it returns to it as an element of prefiguration, Mimesis one in time and narrative. In fact, I want to start from an example of symbolic mediation that recurs offers in time and narrative to help illustrate what the topic entails. Recur writes that when we raise our hand, it is not simply a physical motion, but has meaning as depending upon the context, it can be interpreted as voting, greeting a friend, or hailing a taxi. The physical activity is never isolable from the meaning of the activity. The activity is symbolically mediated. The meaning of action is a language that can be read. Readers of Recur will be familiar with the extension of this argument. Action is a quasi text that can be interpreted. In the lectures, Recur indicates that he grasps his entire analysis of ideology and utopia on Marx's acknowledgement that there is a language of real life that exists before all ideological distortions. For Recur, the symbolic structure of action is absolutely primitive and ineluctable. I return to the import of Recur's insight for his theory of ideology, but want to remain for the moment with the larger implications of Recur's thesis. He frequently reiterates in the lectures that the symbolic structure of action is ineluctable. He claims that a non-symbolic mode of existence and even less a non-symbolic kind of existence can no longer obtain. The world of human action, of human praxis, must immediately have a symbolic dimension. Praxis must have from the beginning a symbolic dimension so that it must have and receive its own language. No social action is not already symbolically mediated. The import of this thesis for the larger inquiry into the nature of imagination is also telling. Recur relates symbolic mediation with the imaginary. We would not be able to understand the notion of the imaginary if reality were not already symbolically mediated. There is a primary imaginary structure of our being in the world. The imaginary is constitutive of our relation to the world. The social imagination, Recur writes, is constitutive of social reality. In turn, interpretation is not isolable from, but integral to human praxis. It is so primitive that in fact, it is constitutive of the dimension of praxis. So symbolic mediation, meaning, imagination, and interpretation are all interrelated and all are interrelated as integral to human action. The consequences of this thesis are immense. Human activity begins not in abstract logic or isolable fact, but in symbolic mediation. And the lectures recur extends the argument to human activity beginning in rhetoric. We see similar threads across recur's corpus. 
and the rule of metaphor recur hypothesizes that we begin in metaphor. Is there not, in Gadamer's terms, he says, a metaphoric at work at the origin of logical thought at the root of all classification? In time and narrative, as previously noted, Recur returns to the symbolic mediation of action and maintains that we begin in figuration, particularly prefiguration. To my knowledge, the secondary literature has little developed these subtexts across Recur's works and their consequences either for Recur's corpus on its own or for social theory at large. I'll comment on these larger implications after incorporating Recur's extension of these arguments for ideology. Recur is quite direct that ideology and utopia are intimately connected to the symbolic mediation of action. Ideology and utopia, he writes, have ultimately to do with the character of human action as being mediated, structured, and integrated by symbolic systems. If symbolic mediation is ineradicable, so is ideology. A pre-symbolic and therefore pre-ideological stage of real life can nowhere be found. Recur's main thesis is that underlying the distortive level of ideology identified and explored by Marx, there must be a constitutive level of ideology, a level of symbol symbolization itself that can be distorted. If there were not symbolic mediation already at work in the most basic kind of action, there would be no symbolic structure that could be distorted. Recur types the constitutive level of ideology as non-pejorative, one that seeks to preserve social and individual identity. While the utopia too can have a distortive function as escapist, it has a constitutive function as well to help us imagine and bring to reality alternate futures. The utopia itself offers a form of identity, a prospective identity, something that we seek and are yet not. If the constitutive and distortive aspects of ideology and utopia relate to the symbolic mediation of action, so does the third component of ideology and utopia, its role as legitimation or as contestation of power. As Recur relates, the process of legitimation lies within the level of symbolization. For many who participate in society, their engagement is not simply a matter of a social contract, of giving to the society in return for what is received, but depends on belief. The symbols and symbolic structure of society, culture, or nation do not give rise simply to thought, but to belief. And acknowledgement that some in society may not believe does not negate the point that many do. In the lectures, Recur, of course, addresses the topic of leg legitimation in, in his discussion of Max Weber. Recur observes that in each of the types of authority that Weber addresses, the legal, traditional, and charismatic, the leader's assertion of authority rests finally on the citizen's re-belief, Glauben. A system of power ultimately rests on our belief. If ideology acts to consolidate and reinforce this belief, the utopia offers the space to challenge this belief. The deeper contributions of the lectures to the theories of ideology and utopia and to the nature of the social and cultural imagination can be aptly summarized in Recur's response to Marx. First, Marx argues for a differentiation between an economic infrastructure and a superstructure of ideas. Ideas are an afflux of the infrastructure of material behavior. But Recur maintains that Marx's allowance of a language of real life shows that the symbolic mediation of action permeates the economic infrastructure. The symbolic mediation of action is in fact infrastructural itself, inextricable to human action. While distortive ideology may be contrasted with praxis, a more constitutive form of ideology as symbolic mediation offers an interconnection with praxis. Symbolic mediation, imagination, and interpretation go all the way down. Second, symbolic mediation offers a motivational model pertaining to our relation to structures of power, including belief, and this displaces Marx's causal relation between infrastructure and superstructure. The motivational model here better founds the possibility of agency in human praxis. Third, Marx criticizes as fallow because it does not affect change. Interpretation remains caught in the superstructure, the world of ideas. In the language of Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. 
yet recur response, the utopia is not simply a dream, but seeks to change reality. The fiction that is a utopian form of productive imagination does not remain in the air, but aims to shatter reality. Like ideology in its constitutive faction, it can act at an infrastructural level. I now wanna pull back from specific discussion of the themes of the lectures to argue for their continuing vitality today. To do so, I return to the three stages of contextualization with which I began and proceed in a reverse order. First, it is likely only too apparent that the lectures, irrespective of their focus on the precise topics of ideology and utopia, offer decisive contributions to the contemporary attention to the social imaginary. In fact, I would argue that recurs developments in the lectures and elsewhere of the theme of the symbolic mediation of action goes significantly further than the work of Castoriadis and Charles Taylor in clarifying how the social imaginary operates. Substantively, the thesis of the symbolic mediation of action is also hugely important. As I shall pursue in more detail when turning to other stages of contextualization, it is an essential contribution of recurs to articulate that human culture is situated and begins in symbolic mediation. We begin not with reason, fact, or quantification, but in meaning, imagination, metaphor, rhetoric, and yes, ideology. As I attempt to elaborate elsewhere, perhaps the best way to encapsulate Recur's approach here is to relate it to his thesis in time and narrative. We begin in figuration. This seems a momentous reversal of the Enlightenment claim asserting the primacy of reason. As evident, there is much value in Recur's analysis and lectures on the symbolic mediation of action that can be retained independent of any attention to ideology. For Recur's work to be congruent with the current turn toward conceptualization of the social imaginary, should we drop the vocabulary of ideology? After all, Recur acknowledges that the ideology is persistently a polemical concept and Charles Taylor insists that the social imaginary allows for constituent function as he claims ideology does not. Even if Taylor does not incorporate Recur's non-pejorative sense of ideology, do we not still give credit to what he means? Characterizing an approach as an ideology is an aspersion, a denunciation. As I averted to at the outset, I do think that the vocabulary of the social imaginary more easily allows for consideration of pos positive functions of social and political life than does the term ideology, it is difficult for ideology to shake its negative connotations. Nevertheless, I would urge that the terminology of ideology be retained and incorporated into the larger perspective of the social imaginary, because the concept of ideology contains values that are often missing or underplayed in the notion of the social imaginary. In part, ideology's weakness, as polemical, as critique, is also its strength. Although critique of particular social imaginaries is not unknown, we more typically seem to conceive of the social imaginary as positive. It is creative, imaginative. But Nazism was also a social imaginary that was creative and imaginative. And we each have our views on so perverse social imaginaries of various political stripes today. The conception of ideology retains the analytic lens that can receive distortion. The conception of ide ideology is also attentive to the problematic of power and legitimacy as an orientation to the social imaginary is often not. And the vocabulary of ideology typically presumes a coherence in approach, perhaps totalistic, that the social imaginary does not. The social imaginary may permit multiple such forms, whereas ideologies may view themselves more in competition each asserting its own view about the proper form of ideological coherence. Finally, while Recur maintains that the major ascription of ideology rightly is political, he also appreciates that the characterization of ideology, including all of the above traits, can apply to other contexts too, economic, moral, aesthetic, religious, and so on. I would also suggest that Recur's concept of the utopia be retained from the lectures and included into the perspective of the social imaginary. The utopian includes the possibility of historical change, as the social imaginary also often, but not necessarily, does. The social imaginary may be static. Retention of the utopian is additionally important in relation to how recurs corpus as a whole offers a resource for considering the social imaginary. 
if, as I have commented, Recur not only continues to adhere to the notion of the symbolic mediation of action, but expands upon it in his development of the notion of figuration, the same persistence is not true in his reference to the utopian. The conjunction in 1975 of Recur's engagement with the rule of metaphor, the lectures on ideology utopia, and the forthcoming lectures on imagination was a time when he emphasized the creativity and productivity of imagination. If Recur's work on metaphor demonstrates that we are not caught in the prison house of language, his work in the two sets of lectures demonstrates similarly that we're not caught in the prison house of contemporary social and political structures. This is the most important message today, in my mind, an essential and abiding contribution of Recur's work here. So in the contemporary context of increased so scholarly regard for the social imaginary, I find much of value to be retained in the lectures on not only the social mediation of action, but the more particular themes of ideology and utopia as well. I offered as the second potential contemporary context for the lectures, Lakoff's work on metaphor and his stress on the inextricability to politics of its moral, mythic, and emotional dimension. And then the third context was the insight from behavioral economics that our minds work primordially on the basis of the intuitive, effective factors of system one, while system two rationality is often more subordinate and interstitial. I want to treat both of them together. It is likely apparent that Recur's elaboration of the symbolic mediation of action fits nicely with Lakoff's emphasis on the moral, mythic, and emotional dimension of politics. I would argue that both extend the intuitive, effective arena of system one. System one informs not only systems of economic behavior or categorization, prototypes, but also affect, emotion. And Lakoff and Recur show how this affect extends to basic political and other beliefs. As I've discussed, part of the message of the symbolic mediation of action is that we begin not only in interpretation, but in belief. Importantly, this beginning in belief influences, at least as a default, each one of us, not just those poor voters we criticize for not making rational choices because they are emotional or ideological. Symbolic mediation is inextricable, and so is ideological mediation, again, at least as a default. I say as a default, as there is some evidence we can train our system to rationality to reduce our ideological bias. But I am skeptical that system two ever prevails over system one. Whether you agree with that judgment, I would still insist that we each begin in system one, in affect, moral intuition, and ideology. Education and intelligence do not automatically insulate us from ideology or bias. Some would claim that education, in fact, allows us to construct more elaborate ideological pyramids. These effective values with which we begin are not necessarily negative. They may, in fact, be ennobling, but they are ideological nonetheless. An additional contemporary significance of the lectures then lies in their expanding the reach of system one intuition and affect into our beliefs as affected by the symbolic mediation of action. None of us is immune, a very humbling but illuminating insight. An additional binding significance of this insight into the pervasiveness and ideology and symbolic mediation of action is that it provides crucial understanding into the dynamics of contemporary politics. Systems of belief permeate our politics. In other words, building on Recur, I've discussed these beliefs as political faiths or losses of faith, but I do not belabor that vocabulary here. Yet consider the symbolic mediation of national identity contained in the following inscriptions in the United States. We find language about the sacredness of the United States Constitution and the sacralization of our 1776 Declaration of Independence, something described as an American scripture. In recent French culture, Julia Kristeva writes of this incredible need to believe a position that she adopts herself. The search for political and cultural symbol is felt to be particularly freighted when the search may be in vain. The persisting role of belief is in reinforced by its potential loss. In France, as many of you know, Pierre Nora led a project to locate the, the, the lieu de mémoire 
uh, the symbolic elements of the memorial heritage of France impose whether their power of legitimacy persists or has become disenchanted. Is perhaps President Macron attentive to the need for the symbolization, the symbolism, as some news reports have indicated, in stage setting his speech the night of his election in the courtyard of the Louvre and in his reception of President Putin at Versailles? Is he responding to the claim that in our fractured age we would experience a collapse of faith in political and public institutions? To be more precise, we cannot understand contemporary politics if we do not view it through the perspective of the symbolic mediation of action and the role of belief. The presidential victory of Donald Trump in the United States was undoubtedly in part as a result of the policies he advocated, bringing back employment in the coal industry, for instance. I set aside whether the policy was an actual aim or a deception. But his success was much more a result of the mythos he created where not only America would be made a great again, but so would individual, particularly working class Americans. By contrast, whatever the merits of Hillary Clinton's candidacy, she and her campaign found it very difficult to articulate the values, the beliefs they wanted to promote. I remember an editorial cartoon from 2008 when Ms. Clinton ran against Barack Obama where the cartoonist depicted Ms. Clinton sitting next to civil rights leader, Dr. Martha Luther King, then deceased, likely a surrogate, a representation of Mr. Obama. The cartoonist had Dr. King voice his famous lines, I have a dream, while Ms. Clinton articulated that she had a comprehensive, multi-pronged, poll-tested, proactive proposal. The King and Obama lines resonated with underlying beliefs and values. Ms. Clinton could only speak of bureaucratic programs. And the characterization of her in 2008 remained accurate throughout 2016 to her detriment. There's a continuing source of amazement that in the United States is the Republican Party, whose politicians understand and build upon the need to speak to voters' beliefs, System One, while the more Democrat, excuse me, more liberal Democratic Party largely continues, as with Ms. Clinton, to speak at the level of rational policy, System Two. It appeared that similarly at stake in the recent presidential election in France was a basic decision about values and beliefs, about what it means today to be French. Emmanuel Macron's vision of a France that was more open and European prevailed, of course, against Marine Le Pen's vision of a fr France for the true French. Macron had to fight off perceptions that he was only a remote system two rational thinker, the investment banker, and economic minister. It was interesting in this regard that in the midst of the campaign, Macron traveled to a small village in where he had spent some of his childhood, not to gather local votes, but to show voters nationwide his attachment to his terroir, his roots. These themes and the relation between Recur and Macron, as you may know, a former Recur student, are now explored at greater, greater length by the intellectual historian Francois Doss in his new book, Le Philosophe et le Président. In both the American and French context, a great insight of Recur's delineation of ideology as integrative is that it makes apparent that individual or group social identification takes place on the basis of symbolic values, and these symbolic values may diverge from economic criteria. No longer is economic reasoning necessarily basic to human identity. Other values may well hold integrative sway. Recur's analysis of the symbolic mediation of action and its manifestations as ideology utopia continue not only to have significant value, but deserve much greater appreciation for incisive understanding of contemporary culture and politics. In the final section of my presentation, I turn from the larger ramification of the lectures and their analysis of the contemporary social imaginary to the text's distinctive contributions within Recur's corpus. Along the way, I pursue some subjects in the text that the volume treats only briefly, whose implications are weighty and are left to us to engage and cultivate. At many levels, then, the, the lectures remain a rich resource, both for the themes that it does address and for the subjective topics on which it offers uh, but brief hints. On some of these topics, I've written at greater length elsewhere, as I reference in my endnotes. My first point is that the lectures appeared at a signal time in Recur scholarship during the same year as the publication of La Métaphore Vive and the Lectures on Imagination. Throughout this period, Recur is very attentive to the possibilities of creative and productive imagination. 
In the lectures, the utopia offers the possi possibility, the potential for shattering reality, for creative and transformative imagination. This emphasis on the creative imagination recedes and recurs subsequent works where the turn is more to the narrative as a recounting of a story or to memory and history. Much as I find great value in recurs later works, for me, his dedication in the lectures and in the other work of this period to the creative imagination and its social and political opportunities as utopia mark a high point of his intellectual career. The lectures are also vital for establishing the availability of critique within hermeneutics, but arguing that the critique occurs on the basis of a juxtaposition between ideological and utopian views, each engaging in a critique of the limitations of the other. This juxtaposition offers a certain solution to the problem of judgment, but insists that no point of view exists outside the game. I find this insight very probing and again would differentiate the stage of recurs thinking from later reflections where in his adoption of the formal rule of moral universalism, he turns more Kantian and Habermasian even as he integrates the formal rule with practical wisdom. The lectures are intriguing as well because they provide hints about recurs theory of interpretation writ large on bases that persist across much of his corpus but remain subtexts, only briefly illumined throughout. A good example in the lectures returns us to recurs seizing on Marx's recognition that beyond the distortions of current political and economic practice, there may exist a language of real life. If earlier I emphasized how for recur the language of real and distorted life is symbolically mediated, now my emphasis is on the differentiation between the languages of real and distorted life. According to Marx, the language of distorted life is the language of representation, Vorstellung while the language of real life is the language of presentation, Darstellung. Recur observes that Marx retains from Hegel that beyond distorted representation, there exists real presentation. The way granted presentation, Darstellung, for the language of real life is quite fascinating since, as Jean Grandin points out, Gadamer's her hermeneutics is guided by the concept of Darstellung. Does Recur agree with this differentiation? Recur comments first, we must preserve the term Vorstellung for it is the basic notion for what ideology means. Despite its limited presence in the text, we must retain the significance of the implication of Vorstellung as a conceptualization of ideology. And yet Recur does not limit Vorstellung to distortion. Consistent with his larger thesis about the range in ideology from distortion to integration, Recur maintains the concept of ideology may be large enough to cover not only distortions, but all representations, all Vorstellung. I've long been struck by the numerous moments where a discussion of Vorstellung and Darstellung pops up in Recurse Corpus, but have not had the chance to pursue the topic at, at length. The lectures offers another significant opportunity in which to see these terms at work in Recur and in preceding thought. Pulling back from the larger range of recurs corpus, the lectures are important also for their interrelation with the lectures on imagination. I find it interesting, for example, that recur does not delve into the distortions of imagination in the imagination lectures as he does into the distortions of ideology or utopia. The analytic framework of the lectures may prove useful to interrogate imagination more closely. The role of the utopia in the lectures is also meaningful as a point of comparison to what Recur deems the highest form of productive imagination, the creation of a fiction. Both offer alternatives to pre present reality and both partake of the nowhere, which is the literal definition of the utopia. In turn to the lectures themselves, there's much that remains to explore, evaluate, and extend it. I offer just a few suggestions. First, there seems to be some ambiguity in Recur's discussion of a utopia between its ability to shatter reality and its potential as imaginative variation. The latter, which builds on Husserl, projects possibilities, but ones that remain hypothetical. The utopia shattering, by contrast, suggests the realization of a new truth, not just a hypothetical, that comes to life. Utopia shattering seems more similar to the seeing as of metaphor we bridge to something new, while the utopia as imaginative variation seems more typically a matter of as if. Given my concern that in Recur's subsequent work, he seems to give less weight to the productive imagination as utopian in the sense of shattering 
it seems revealing that in time and narrative configuration, Mimesis II is described as the kingdom of the as if. There also seems much more to mind in Recur's work on legitimacy. Is he accurate that all political systems cannot survive only on the basis of the imposition of force, but require legitimization, that is, citizenry belief? Is Recur correct that in every political system there is a gap in level between the authorities? Peter's claim and the belief in this authority offered by the citizenry. What explains the basis for this gap? Note that this question is different from how the surplus value of ideological legitimation seeks to fill this gap. Recur's discussion of legitimation seems to focus more on its distortive side. Should there also be development of legitimation's goal to partake of an integrative ideology? The citizenry belief as a factor than symbolic mediation of action integral to even positive forms of legitimation. What is the import in Recur's discussion of legitima le excuse me, legitimacy of his emphasis on the role of motivation as distinguished from the causality of the Marxist model? As I've indicated, these are only suggestions of the riches that may be discovered through critical examination of the lectures on its own in relation to the remainder of his corpus and in relation to broader contemporary topics such as the social imaginary. I thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this discussion and look forward to hearing your thoughts and comments as our discussion continues. Thank you. Agora nós temos um período para perguntas. As perguntas em português podem ser feitas, eu vou fazer a tradução para o professor. Né? E as perguntas em inglês podem ser feitas diretamente, vai passar um microfone sem fio para todos. Né? So the questions in English can be addressed directly to o professor Taylor. Or French, he said. <laughs> And the questions in Portuguese will be addressed to me, and I will translate to Professor Taylor. Okay? Alguém tem alguma pergunta em português, inglês, francês? Estamos com tudo aqui hoje. In English, I try. Um, thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. I, I agree with you with, for the analysis you made of the action of President Macron, I think, is trying to make uh, alive the symbolism of uh, the French nation and the importance of his history. You know, the memory for him yeah. is very important. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, by chance that he was assistant of Ricoeur when he was writing memory, memory history. Yeah. Yeah. I forget it. Yeah. I forget it. But I think the, the subject of memory is very important. But I had a question about the, the dialectic between uh, ideology and Utopia. Mm -hmm. It's always a problem for me because uh, uh, they are linked together. But the problem is in a society, the ideology of the, the, the maybe I will take you back the, your, your, your name of uh, social imaginary. Social imaginary of the majority group is named ideology. And the social imaginary of the minorities are utopia. So this dialectic reflects also something of the social battle. Yeah. Uh, de definitely, and Recur, I think, uh, does address that. And, and so it's not, uh, there is no neutral way to describe this group as ideological or this group as utopian. And so it, it partly it's a matter from the, from the perspective of the different group. It's the opposing, it's ideological, where ours is utopian. And so there's, it's, it is a dialectic, uh, and that's, it is one of the, uh, complications of this, uh, that it, it's a to and fro, that there's no uh, ob objective pr presentation in terms of what is ideological and what is not. And so, for example, uh, someone's more politically conservative, uh, they may describe um, some, some liberal, liberal radical as ideological, it's simply um, superstructural, and, and the reverse would occur from the liberal to the conservative. And if I, if I, sure. I could add that uh, also we are trying to reflect about the constant democratic in ah. democracy. Mm -hmm. The problem of consent of the oh, concern. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. uh, because of course uh, uh, the legitimacy of the representative 
Uh, what yeah, state. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. So the okay. form of consent mm -hmm. could be mm -hmm. linked with the social media too. Right. And also we could link in with the recognition. You know, maybe we could make the link also between ideology and utopia and the problem of recognition, which is a belief uh, also. Uh, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I am aware that in the ideology and utopia text, there are some brief mentions of the notion of recognition, but it's not well developed. That, that would be a, a fruitful way to tie it. And you're certainly right in terms of the notion of consent. Uh, the, the whole question of the legitimacy of present governments and of our, our representatives is a critical question. So it's not just a contract, but there is a sense of either we, we do believe or we don't believe. And if you have lost that belief, uh, that's, that's a serious loss that, not, that econ economic measures um, do not simply replace. And so, and that's often, as I tried to indicate, that's often a dimension that is not particularly attended, where I think recurs analysis can, can open up perspectives. Yeah, so thank you. Boa noite. É, tem uma pergunta, vou fazer em português mesmo. É, durante a palestra foi mencionada a imaginação produtiva. E, uhum. yeah. Yeah. Uhum. e eu fiquei na dúvida se essa, o imaginário social tem alguma ligação com a imaginação produtiva e criativa do Kant que o Ricardo usa. O imaginário social teria alguma ligação com a teoria do Kant de imaginação produtiva uhum. e criativa que o Ricker usa uhum. para construir a criptosinímesis em tempo narrativo? Que, é, se tem alguma coisa a ver com a criptosinímesis do Ricker em tempo narrativa, a imaginação produtiva e criativa de Kant. Eu queria saber se ela se liga ao imaginário social. Uh -huh. In relation to question. Okay. Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. I respond in uh, English. Um, I don't, do you want to trans? Do, do I need to translate? You okay? No. Okay, okay, no, no. thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, the, uh, the answer would take me into his separate lectures on imagination, which I'm editing now. And uh, he has two lectures there on Kant in, in the development of that. And uh, as you know, uh, that the notion of productive imagination in Kant's first critique is related to the empirical understanding. And then he, in the, the second lecture, he's relating to the third critique. And so the notion of productive imagination is more creative, it's aesthetic. And so it's going beyond the limitations to the empirical understanding. And partly uh, here, of course, uh, recurs uh, drawing upon uh, Gadamer that whereas uh, Kant made a separation between the aesthetic and the empirical, in terms of the ontology, possibility of truth, recur in the lectures on imagination is trying to develop a theory of fiction as productive imagination. So it's more expansive. And he says that the fiction uh, creates a, a nowhere that does not exist. And that is the productive, that is the truly productive imagination. It's something new, transformative, has not existed before. And so he's building upon Kant, but going way beyond Kant in terms of the limitations of the Kant uh, structure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, George. I think we might have discussed this once before, but I'd like to just um, see where you stand on it at this time. When you talk about the uh, imagination, the productive imagination, and you uh, 
uh, and with its utopian implications. Um, you you are saying this was one of the high points mm -hmm. of his career. Yes. But it does seem as he moves towards ethics, mm -hmm. he becomes much more cautious. And there's somewhere where he says, you know, I would not expect, uh, be expecting that much mm -hmm. of the imagination. Right. Um, right. We have to be very strictly reflective in our, um, and, yeah. and uh, I think it's deliberative reflection he's talking about before we put anything from the imagination into action. Mm -hmm. So you, um, and so I was thinking with too with the Kantian mm -hmm. two forms. Yeah. Um, so if it was his high point, do you think his moving towards ethics then uh, sort of dampens down that type of, you know, as we say, yeah. open-endedness? Right. That uh, yeah. you know, future orientation. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. And it's a, it's a very important question. And uh, the way I would put it uh, that, and let me focus just in terms of his discussion of the utopia. So that for the utopia, just as with his description of ideology, it's tripartite. Uh, so there can be a constitutive notion of, of the utopia, but there can also be the utopia simply escapist. And I might, since it, in terms of the overlay, certainly there are other dimensions in, in his move toward the ethics. Uh, part of his, the, the tragedy of human action, uh, which I think really becomes a prominent theme, a much more prominent theme. But I think it uh, too much clouds his, what he had available. And so it's not to reject that we need deliberation, it doesn't reject the need to engage in reflection in terms of impact. Patient, but to I use the, the metaphor uh, drawn from Frederick, uh, Jameson of the prison house of language and the prison house of social and political structures. We can break that. That's a that I think for many of us today that is a, a incredibly vital insight that we're not caught in our contemporary. There are alternatives, and I think we need to hold on to that and open ourselves to that. And so we need to open ourselves to the possibility of the new of the transformative. And then we don't we don't simply run with it. Then the reflection has to occur, the engagement, the working out the details, um, creation, creation of legal structures, etc. But the the transformative moment, the transfiguration, seems to be uh, less visible in the subsequent work. I, I know it's very late in the day, and <laughs> people have had a very likely time. Everybody's so, tired. Yeah, so, so <laughs> I, I thank you for your attention and appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Bom, é, desejamos realmente a todos uma, uma ótima noite. Obrigado pela pela parceria, pelo trabalho durante o dia todo. Então, amanhã vamos para a nossa terceira jornada e o nosso trabalho, então, começa amanhã às é, 9h30 e daí nós vamos ter uma sessão paralela que são que é dividida em quatro momentos, a das 9h até às 10h30, depois o intervalo e aí das 11h até às 12h30 temos outra sessão paralela com quatro momentos de atividade. E às 14h30, então, nós temos o encerramento da, da nossa, do nosso encontro com a palestra do professor Alan Tomasset, é, Paul Riquet, Fundamentos de uma Ética Hermenêutica e Narrativa. E uma outra, uh, outra observação, vocês viram que o caderno de resumos, tá bom, já foi tirado aqui, ele está exposto uh, no, no Facebook, em outras páginas, vocês nos procurem caso uh, vocês não tenham conseguido. Aqueles que esqueceram de assinar as atas importantes, em função depois das questões burocráticas e certificado, não se esqueçam de, de fazer isso hoje ou amanhã, então dá um jeito. É, quem não se inscreveu ainda, é importante que se inscreva para poder ter o certificado. Muito bem, então a todos uma ótima noite e amanhã nos, nos encontramos aqui então.
Nice.